Hi everyone, so um, welcome this evening. Um, great that you could join us. Um, I've got uh, Molly um, uh, Harris Olsen with us here. Um, just firstly, um, Molly, did you want to switch your video on and introduce yourself? Happy to. It's Molly Harris Olsen. I'm the CEO of Fair Trade Australia and New Zealand and the former chair of the Global Board of Fair Trade. And it's a real delight to be here with Nimity uh, and um, sharing this uh, in information with you. Thanks, Molly. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the chair of the um, Fair Trade Association of Australia and New Zealand. And uh, what we're going to be speaking about, of course, is um, how we work together and just to help um, understand how we how we fit together as a movement. So um, just before we get started, sorry, I just did want to do an acknowledgement to country. Um, so I acknowledge the traditional owners on the land from which I'm presenting, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, um, and I pay my respects to elders past and present, and also pay the respect to elders and past and present from wherever you're residing and listening. So um, Molly, I might hand over to you to talk to this. Absolutely delighted. Um, look, um, the question that people often ask us is, um, what is the fair trade movement and why should I care? Um, things are happening all the way around the world. But in fact, um, what we are seeing in the world today is increasing, not decreasing levels of inequality in the world. There's 700 million people that are actually living on less than a dollar a day. And that includes, for example, most cocoa farmers in the world. If we look at a subject like coffee um, in the last five years, if you're a coffee farmer and you're not receiving the fair trade minimum price and premium, then actually the minimum price, or excuse me, the commodity price of coffee has only reached the fair trade minimum price that they pay every day uh, in, for three weeks in that five years. So, so if you're a coffee farmer, in five years, you've only received a fair price for three weeks if you're generally selling your coffee. So these kinds of issues of unfairness are really um, uh, stopping the world, I think, and I think we all would agree, from actually having the human dignity that we need to kind of live uh, in harmony on the planet. So the world's 26 richest people actually now hold as much wealth as the poorest half of the population. And this is again, just evidence that the world is getting increasingly less fair and it's to no fault of producers in countries around the world. Did you, were you, did you want me to address this one? You, you can go ahead, yeah, I'll, yeah. I might as well jump in very briefly and then you can add to it. You can certainly add to it. So modern slavery is the latest um, uh, example of the kind of uh, inequality that we're looking at. And there are a variety of forms of modern slavery. It comes with um, just um, uh, being exploited and because you're poor, having no control over your life and your future, having no sustainable livelihood, being displaced uh, by war and disasters or just marginalized through general discrimination. What fair trade has been uh, combating with the way it's tried to engineer for fair in its supply chains is a transparency and a accountability that doesn't exist in any normal supply chains really in the world. Uh, and modern slavery is just the latest example. Maybe Nimity, you'd like to add to that. Yes, well, well some of us on this um, meeting this evening would have actually joined um, a, a webinar that we had last week with Be Slavery Free, when we spoke quite a bit about modern slavery in its different forms. And I think one of the things that is um, really crucial for us all to understand is that slavery doesn't exist for the most part without poverty. Um, poverty um, is, is a huge contributor to slavery. And, and it's when somebody doesn't have enough, uh, has, has, doesn't have good employment that they're likely to take risks with the choices that they make. And that's how they end up in difficult circumstances that they can't get themselves out of. And that's where fair trade really is an antidote to modern slavery because we're able to put the systems and the practices in place so that it doesn't happen in the first place, as well as just thinking about stopping the slavery that's happening out there. Yeah. So um, these are some of the, the types of modern slavery that, um, that you may or may not be aware of. So there's, there's threats within the workplace. There are some terribly sad stories about violence uh, that people have to live with um, just to work. And of course, often they, they don't get paid at all or they get paid very little, um, if, if at all. 
And there's a lot of coercion in terms of things like you do this or I'm going to hurt your family kind of coercion or coercion in terms of getting people into a situation that they, they wouldn't have gotten into if they'd been known what they were getting into. Uh, so a lot of deception, things like hiding people's passports so that they can't leave the situation that they're in uh, or um, you know, simply um, hiding their, their other papers and identification papers. And it can start from a very young age, of course. Molly, did you want to add? Just, just to say that one of the greatest tragedies of all is how many children uh, and women in particular are, are, are affected by this terrible, terrible situation. 160 million children um, and, and then another 79 million in hazardous work. It's just, it is just uh, absolutely shocking and there is absolutely no excuse globally. Uh, humanity is certainly wealthy enough to, to keep children in schools. And um, it is just devastating to see what's happening in, in these parts of the world where slavery in its modern forms uh, has taken hold. Yes. And the one thing I should just add, uh, Nimity, is that actually, you know, we think that it's, it's divided, but actually there's a lot of slavery in Italy. There's a lot of slavery in California. There's actually slavery in fruit picking up in Queensland. So it's not as if um, uh, we in the developed world are immune from these practices. In fact, uh, it, it is much more likely to be divisions within countries that actually are the cause of this. And, and so um, it's something that we need to be aware of everywhere and that we need to eliminate absolutely everywhere. Yes, absolutely. And just adding to your point there in regards to the, um, the children that are, are impacted or in forced labour, um, this is the, the International Year of the Elimination of Child Labour. Um, and uh, unfortunately, um, this year, the, you know, the year on year, there was an increase in, in children in child labour, unfortunately, for the first time in, in, in a while. And part of I that is 20 the, years. It was the first time in a very long time. It's devastating. Mm. Yeah, so obviously some impacts there uh, flow on from the economic situation and COVID and all the other things that are going on around the world at the moment. So what is fair trade? So uh, some of you on the call would already know, some, some may not know very much about what fair trade is, but we are a movement that empowers disadvantaged people. Um, so primarily in developing countries, but um, really the aim is to create, help them create and sustain their own livelihoods through employment, regular income, and improved working conditions. Um, but a key part of that is actually giving them access to markets. So if you're um, a disadvantaged producer somewhere in the world, um, living in a rural area, you know, the ability for you to find someone to buy your product is, is very limited without help. And so that's where the fair trade movement really comes in. Did you wanna add anything to that, Molly? You're on mute again, sorry. <laughs> Uh, it's such a bad habit. Um, just uh, just to, to add that um, uh, it is really interesting how the understanding of trade and its inequities has changed over the years. And uh, fair trade itself um, actually evolved. And in 2013, we actually made the producers and workers in the fair trade system of certified products half owners of the global system. So they are half of the General Assembly, half of the global board, and every decision about finances, about strategy, about investments is all um, not just informed by the people who we're working with, but actually are, is by the people that we're working with and trying to make trade fair with. And so it's a big issue and a big challenge, but, um, but I think we're getting better and better. And I would say that in the world today, uh, whereas 30 years ago, when these sorts of movements started, we really didn't have all the information we needed to be able to do conduct trade fairly. And we now know exactly what we need to do. So the problem isn't that we don't know how to fix these supply chains or create transparency or accountability in them, the problem is just a, uh, a recalcitrance in not doing it, which is again, why we see modern slavery. Yes, I, th I think it's a really great point, actually. Um, you know, we talk about empowerment, but what, what do we mean by that? And, um, you know, when I visited um, in Uganda, a group of um, artisans, um, a big part of, you know, what the work there is ensuring that they're actually running their own enterprise and making the decisions. So it's not about giving them necessarily just support but it's charity actually, it's not charity yeah that's right great point so how do we go about alleviating poverty then well i mentioned we connect disadvantaged producers with consumers 
um, and we promote fair pay and working conditions. So this fair pay and working conditions is really that antidote to the slavery that we were talking about. Um, and also helping people to grow beyond um, uh, living at a very subsistence level to be able to educate their children and go on and, and do more and, and benefit the people beyond those just working directly in fair trade. Um, the other um, point is that um, a lot of people may not think about when they think fair trade is actually a part of what we do within the movement is also work with producers and businesses that buy from those producers and sell in countries like Australia uh, to make sure that they're implementing positive and, and good uh, environmental practices within their organisations as well. Molly, did you want to add? Oh, I, no, I think um, I think you've you've covered that very well. I do think that um, what we what we're seeing is a structural problem, and it requires a, a systematic and structural solution. Um, and I guess the, the the point about how we alleviate poverty and why we have more modern slavery now than ever before is because the way we've addressed it as a problem has been to push it away and to push it further down into supply chains where nobody can see it. So people think they don't have slavery in their supply chains, but actually it's just because it's a don't ask, don't tell global economy. And there's a, a plausible deniability that's built in for particularly big, big companies and big um, traders um, so that they don't have to be held to account. So it's very important that these principles are uh, understood and accepted by people and that there's ways of, of being able to, to get visibility about what's actually happening in these communities and in these supply chains. Yes, that's right. So. Um, it's People might see the point at the bottom here that there are some core principles um, that underpinning the fair trade movement. And there's two um, major organizations globally um, that work closely together. Uh, there's the, the WFTO uh, that have the 10 principles of fair trade, uh, which is the, and I'll touch on that a, a little bit later. And there's also the fair trade standard set by Fair Trade International. Yeah. So, um, uh, this is a proverb that I quote quite a bit. I, I think it really um, sums up for me the how in terms of how we go about and uh, you know actually creating a solution uh, out there. So it is a, it is a huge challenge that of modern slavery, that of, of global poverty. Um, but I very strongly believe that you know in this concept that you know as Molly said, it's not a charity model. It's a model where we teach people to have their own business. So if, if you give someone a fish and you feed them for a day, teach them for, to fish and you feed them for a lifetime, I think is, is really true. So we touched on just there, um, uh, the two organizations. So um, I'm the, uh, with the Fair Trade Association, the chair and Molly's the CEO of Fair Trade um, Australia and New Zealand. And so how do they fit into those um, two global organisations that we mentioned? So just at a very high level, um, the Fair Trade Association um, is associated at a global level with the WFTO, so that's the World Fair Trade Organisation, and Fair Trade Australia and New Zealand is, is aligned with Fair Trade International. But we are all part of the same movement and we're all trying to achieve, uh, at the end of the day, we're trying to achieve um, the same good in the world. Molly, did you want to talk to this one? Sure. Um, so fair trade, um, uh, it, it, it is a certification. It is the most trusted ethical label in the world um, and the most recognized. Uh, but the certification is really sort of the icing on the cake of what is the standards that sit underneath the, that certification and then the auditing and transparency that enforces that um, set of standards. So if we look at the process that fair trade goes through, it's, it's appropriate to big global commodities where there are big global traders. It's not possible to do this kind of um, certification on, uh, on arts and crafts, which are also very, very important mechanisms for income for communities and very important also for um, social um, reasons to, to maintain arts and, and, uh, and historic ways of um, creating crafts and things. But in the fair trade commodity world, um, these are big, big commodities. The seven big commodities that fair trade deals with are cotton, tea, coffee, banana, sugar, cocoa, and flowers. These are the, the big commodities where there is a lot of poverty. And the way fair trade deals with it is to have a structure of standards, which is across people, planet, and prosperity. They're all measurable standards. So you can actually tell if there's a breach of those standards. And there is a consequence for every breach of every standard. So 
it is um, the reason it is so trusted is because of that rigor and robustness in its structures. But it has to be that way with these kinds of global commodities. As I say, if we're talking about um, other sorts of commodities like um, uh, beaded uh, crafts or, or weaving or fabrics that are hand woven and hand spun, it is nearly impossible to um, have structures that can properly really um, uh, support those sorts of things. So you have to look at it as very different um, requirements, really. So fair trade really is the kind of big end of the commodity markets and, um, and tries to support um, WT WFTO in terms of how it would deal with all of the range of other activities in the world that need to be um, and should be also fair. Um, fair trade also has a minimum price. So as I mentioned with coffee, the minimum price for coffee, it has been um, above the traded price of commodity uh, the commodity for tw for the last five years, with the exception of three weeks. So it's very important that minimum price because it protects the farmers from uh, having to sell their commodity below the cost of production. If you're selling your coffee below the cost of production, you are grinding into poverty systemically, systemically and systematically. So um, that's an important thing. And then there's a premium that goes on top of that commodity price. And that premium is to enable communities to be able to have big decisions together about what they need for their chosen development path. And in the fair trade system, we audit the governance around how they make those decisions. We don't ever tell them how to spend that premium money. It is completely their decision. What we audit is that um, the decisions were made with all of the um, members of the cooperative present. Uh, women were allowed to vote. There were public meetings and the meetings were minuted and that they spent the money on what they said they were gonna spend it on. Now that premium now uh, across the fair trade world is around, it's over $700 um, million every year for producers around the world. And that's a very significant sum of money because it's on top of the commodity price that they're getting for their cocoa or their coffee or their tea. It actually enables them to build the schools, to build the hospitals, to, to create the, the potable water and do the other kind of big infrastructure things that a community would not um, normally have the ability to do, build schools and have teachers, et cetera. Yes. Yeah, so um, in terms of you mentioned that it does, it's, the commodity model doesn't fit for, for everything that we want to do. Exactly. Um, so for most uh, things, in yeah. fact. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a bigger, broader fair trade movement beyond that as well, um, exactly. which, um, is, which is where um, the association comes in to sort of bring the, the broadness across both of those. So in terms of the Fair Trade Association in Australia, uh, we're actually an organisation of business members that support the fair trade movement. So amongst our business members are um, members that who themselves um, work directly with artisans in other countries. They're also often retailers that sell fair trade tea and coffee, for example, um, in their shops. Um, they may support fair trade business, uh, the fair trade movement in other ways. We also provide endorsement through the Fair Trader of Australia program. So that's for those business members that are very focused on fair trade and that's sort of the forefront of their business. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit more um, later. But primarily Fair Traders of Australia, it gives us a way to endorse a business. So it's not a product endorsement, it's a business endorsement that's, that says that that business is actually practicing the 10 principles of fair trade. And it also gives businesses a, an option if what they do and what they sell doesn't fit into that commodity model. We also run fair trade communities. Uh, so we have um, fair trade workplaces, towns, schools, and faith groups. And these are communities that are supporters of the movement as well. And they're made up of individuals. And uh, you know the faith groups are often very good at doing things like holding fair trade markets around Christmas time. And um, you know we have uh, fair trade workplaces and that, that also sort of promote, use fair trade in their workplace and promote it themselves. So, so these are the different parts of the movement. I won't spend too long here, but just to help people understand where, where they might fit or where their interests might fit. So we have um, supporters of the movement. So they're um, business members um, of the association and, and friends of fair trade, which are individuals that can also join as a friend. And of course, we've just got that broader base of supporters out there in, in our world that are uh, buying fair trade, which is hugely important and, and a big part of the advocacy work that both of our organisations do. And then we've got um, the endorsed communities. So I touched on there, there's workplaces, schools, faith groups, as you know, any community can really um, 
uh, decide that they want to become a fair trade community. That is something that's verified by us as an association. So we do endorse those community groups. Um, and there, there's some criteria around that in terms of depending on the type of group that it is and what would be appropriate. But in a workplace, for example, they're usually using fair trade uh, products within their workplace. And then uh, they're also doing some advocacy work to, to sort of help promote fair trade in, in a broader context. I mentioned the Fair Traders of Australia. So um, it, their endorsed businesses, uh, as a minimum, they have to sell at least 60% fair trade product. And they must also practice the WFTO 10 principles of fair trade. It's a fairly involved um, endorsement program that we run and, and we work with businesses that are on that journey. And, and we talk about things like, how do I engage my supplier or my producer and, and talk to them about you know, what they're actually paying um, each other or their workers? Is there a living wage in place? What are the working conditions? And actually work with those producers um, to improve those things. And the um, Fair Traders of Australia, um, we also recognise the WFTO product guarantee, which is for those different artisan products and WFTO um, certifications. And you've already touched there on the certified products. Molly, did you want to add to that or? No, no, that's really helpful. Okay. So I'll actually um, hand over to Molly now just for, a, we're just going to talk a little bit more about the work of Fair Trade Australia. So you already touched on these. Um, Molly, did you want to talk a little bit more? Yeah. Uh, no, I think only just to say that um, the, the structures of minimum price and premium and the standards that sit beneath Fair Trade and the measurability of those things and the continuous improvement of them over time. Um, is are really critical um, pillars of how fair trade does its work. Um, the standards, for example, um, have been mapped against the sustainable development goals. And of course, as you can imagine, with poverty alleviation, gender, environmental protection, there's, there's great um, uh, clarity around what the measurability of those goals should be and how fair trade contributes to the outcomes there. I think the one thing I would say about certification is that um, it's designed to give people a high level of trust, but in, in inevitably, and this has happened with the green movement um, uh, over the years, with the, with the organics movement over the years, it can become very, very frustrating because um, what we've seen in the last, uh, really in the, only in the last five or six years, is for instance, that all of the major cocoa manufacturers, the major chocolate bars, all have their own self-certification. And this is a real problem for, um, for all of us really, because of course, if someone is saying, yes, aren't we wonderful, we do, we do all the right things. Um, it's not the same as having um, some independence and some real visibility on actually what's happening. So it's, um, I would say the world is full of uh, greenwashing and some fair washing, and we have to all be really live to that and try to make sure that we're really holding all of our, our, our operations and our uh, communities to the highest standard we possibly can, because otherwise it's very, very easy, as the cocoa companies have found, to stamp a little thing on there and say, gee, aren't we great? And that's not going to help anyone uh, in a producer country. It's going to really undermine their ability to actually get that living wage. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we should probably mention it for those of the, that weren't aware, it is actually fair trade fortnight at the moment, hence the choose your world you want. <laughs> yeah, <yes>. so, uh, <laughs> exactly. And you, you mentioned earlier the 50% owned by farmers, which is really a powerful thing, I think, Molly. It is a really powerful thing. And it's something we're very, very proud of because it's not easy. I mean, it means that when we recently changed our strategy to 2025, um, you know, it took us 18 months to do a full consultation across 75 countries with producers across, it, there's 11,000 products and, and I can't remember even how many commodities there are globally because it includes things like saffron and gold. But um, it, it does, it is a deep commitment to um, not just uh, fairness, but actually to to their uh, ability to choose their own future and, and be in control of their own lives. And, and it is something that we're very, very proud of. But it's not easy. <laughs> no, yeah, and I, I think you mentioned as well that it's it's not just about the licensing, but um, that there is you know, sort of a, a support and, and other things that you do um, for the businesses here in Australia. Sure. So um, what, what we, uh, I guess the way we measure all of our success really is how, um, how successfully are we growing sales for the producers? That's really the lens through which everything 
goes. So we provide a lot of support to the producers on the ground, but we actually provide a lot of support to businesses to encourage them, first of all, to spend more money in their supply chains and do things properly to avoid modern slavery, etc. We provide support to them to get public awareness um, about what they're doing and why it matters. Um, so we support them a lot with communications. Um, it's been a wonderful thing in the world that social communications have become more uh, easier. And, and uh, although we've seen also that's, that's a little bit challenging too because of the greenwashing and fair washing issues, but communications and social media have provided a really important way. Um, and we support them, of course, through the, the processes of certification and licensing, both on the ground with the producers, but also uh, if they're traders or if they're uh, companies. And again, uh, within the fair trade standards, there are consequences right across that supply chain for the producers or if you're a big trader. So for the producers, for example, um, if, you, if you have failures of governance and you cannot demonstrate that you have had the right proper governance around how you spent the premium, then you can be suspended. Um, and actually it happens um, not infrequently that um, uh, uh, producers can be suspended from the fair trade system. There is a consequence and they will ultimately be, able, be, be forced to leave the same for traders. If a trader is in, in uh, engaging in contracts that are not paying the proper minimum price or premium, that are not allowing the auditor to come in and see transparently what is in those contracts, then a trader can be suspended and similarly with companies. So um, it's a very, very um, uh, robust system. What I would say, uh, which I think is a real uh, challenge for us in the world, is that it is still very much a hands-on uh, analog system. And we really do need to work as a global community to become so aware of these issues that we can digitize across all of these things, because otherwise, um, really, the cost is, is increasing with uh, things like COVID. I mean, it's just impossible to do the kind of audits that we need to do. So we do need to uh, work together to make sure that we can um, get the right technology supporting us and particularly supporting that first mile of producers to be able to share their information effectively with the rest of the market. Yeah, te te technology is, is, has its uh, pros and cons, doesn't it? It really does. There are definitely cons, don't get me wrong. <laughs> mm. So some great numbers here from uh, Fair Trade. Did you want to touch on that, Molly? Oh, just briefly, I mentioned uh, there's about 1.7 million farmers and workers around the world, uh, 75 countries, and um, uh, about 30,000 Fair Trade products. Um, and so it, it is... It is the only really uh, globally scaled alternative, I would call it the alternative trading structures that provide that safety net for the farmers. Um, but it is, as Nimity says, I mean, you know, it touches on seven major commodities and probably even in coffee, we're probably around 10% of the world's traded coffee. Until we can make all trade fair across every commodity in every country, we have a lot of work to do. And, um, and what's apparent to fair trade is that uh, what is necessary to, to really transform trade as a, as a global proposition, especially we've seen it in COVID, is that really the whole world is educated enough to be able to tell the difference and are really choosing those products and very, very choosy about what they're spending their money on because it's very hard to do it. We're not going to do it if it just requires convincing the companies because the companies, every, everybody's looking to save money and everybody's looking to kind of, you know, get the best deal and push the price down. So we need the whole community to be out there demanding these products. Yeah. So I've just got a short video to share with um, with you, which is, I actually um, love this because I actually do buy Papua New Guinea and coffee. And this is about some uh, people in Papua New Guinea. Just make sure that that's playing. Is it going to play? There we go. We are um, isolated bands of people living in a struggle place. that um, uh, no one from outside uh, cares about us and knows about us. But um, we 
we we beginning to appreciate this relationship because of the what you know our coffee can do. The soil is rich, it's volcanic soil, the climate is perfect, the condition is right. We don't need chemicals. PNG is by default organic. PNG coffee is exotic. It's it's um, it's something unique, it's something so different. They're all very curious about it. Coffee is the, it's, it's a main uh, income earner. It's got a readily available market. And we are the oldest in uh, PNG. And it's been 14 years we've been uh, working with uh, Fairtrade. The Fairtrade model is the model that, that looks at about fairness, about equality, about good governance, about environmental protection, about children's rights, about gen gender equality, about climate change. We, we do all of that. We're actually very proud to be, work, to be working with fair trade and to be working with communities and, and coffee farmers and, and drinking coffee. Running a business in this environment is difficult. You need to be able to have a team of people that can actually be able to understand the modern ways of doing things, the business relations, market access, commercial side of things, but also be able to balance it with the traditional ways of doing things. Ricky is tasked with making sure that there is harmony. We get all of that uh, wet Indian bags down to the creek, we we'll wash it, and we carry them up and dry it on a bed that you can see it up there. That's organic, pure organic. The relationship between the uh, work and the fair trade uh, it started some uh, some years back. Work is a Islands Organic Agriculture Cooperative. We have uh, more than 2,600 farmers, farmers who are working under the work. We have more of our youth, our younger generation, wanting to work in an office, don't want to touch that and, and work the land. And if we don't motivate and encourage uh, the younger generation to participate in coffee, think about a future. There is none. With Mitchell as, as a representation of third generation coffee farmer within Hawaii, and being an educated and, and smart person himself, we at Fairtrade are really, truly keen to support him. I have coffee DNA in my veins now. Uh, quality is very insane. It's a labor. It demands uh, effort put into bringing that quality. Quality starts when fruit is plucked off from the coffee tree. From here, once it is dried, it's packed into nylon bags of about 50 to 60 kg per bag. And then it's transported from here down to Goroka for processing into green bean. After it went through some quality checking again, then it's packed and exported out to Australia, New Zealand, Germany, USA, the whole world. Papa. The services that we get from Hoek through Fairtrade Premium is we get water supply for the villages and communities. We get uh, roofing irons. We get uh, pulping machines. We get uh, coffee sauce. And for most of this, we get uh, classrooms for our kids. You can see that we've got a lot of kids now following us. These are the next generation of the next farmers to grow coffee. Anita and the work that she is doing is, if you like, a new dawn, a new movement. So bringing women to be respected and to be valued, it's a huge struggle. I see that uh, women have a lot of role in the coffee. They plant the coffee, harvest the coffee, they process everything with the coffee. I want that change in the lives of my farmers. 
that's why I, they see me that I can fight for their rights to when I, I am in the coffee business. The system basically used trade as a tool, making trade fair uh, to achieve a, a bigger dream, a bigger goal. And it is all about communities, about better living conditions, giving back to the farmers and putting them on the world map. So I always find that um, really, uh, really powerful. And it also makes me feel really guilty um, that I uh, probably burn my coffee way more often than I should when they take so much time to meet you with the quality. Um, well, Nibini, what I, what I do is if I drop a bean uh, I'm before the grinders got it, I'm like carefully picking up the bean because I know exactly how every single bean has been handpicked and carefully, carefully brought you know, all the way across the world, it's it's terrible to think of the time and investment that goes into those wonderful, wonderful farmers that um, that yeah. is, is worth honoring. Mm. Absolutely. So I'm just going to touch briefly on um, the, our side the, of the movement or the broader side of the movement. Um, so I mentioned um, the business members. So um, members of the association is, is a great place to start a fair trade journey because it's it, it, it enables you to become part of a community and just learn a little bit more about the movement. And, and also we have network groups of business members that uh, are often at markets together and, and catch up on a regular basis. Um, and it's from there that you can learn, um, you know, if you want to go further with your fair trade journey. And um, fair trade communities I touched on as well. So um, fair trade workplaces, uh, we've had uh, recently had uh, seed workplaces, uh, became a seed a workplace this year. We've had some new faith groups come on this year as well. So. We, we are um, uh, getting some great, uh, great groups coming on board. And these are the real champions of the movement. These are the people out there um, walking the walk and talking the talk about fair trade, um, which is hugely powerful because, uh, you know, that we need businesses selling and doing the right thing with fair trade, but we absolutely need people buying uh, fair trade as well. The Fair Traders of Australia, um, I touched on this earlier as well. So they sell more than 60% as a minimum fair trade product and are actively working to increase this wherever they can. They practice the WFTO 10 principles of fair trade and they're endorsed businesses, as I mentioned. So endorsed businesses opposed to a product certification. And so um, a, a business that is selling, for example, you know, a significant amount of um, fair trade certified product um, that helps them look at whether, you know, becoming a fair trader of Australia is a good option. And we can also work with businesses who are particularly who are working with small scale artisans. So Molly mentioned that, um, you know, the commodity model is very much focused on, on a bigger business in some ways. But if you're working, for example, with, um, you know, a, a group in Uganda who made these handmade paper beads that I'm wearing on my arm, uh, we can help you work with those groups and implement the, the 10 principles of fair trade and then endorse your business. So I've, I've mentioned the 10 principles of fair trade as set out by the WFTO. Um, also, as um, Molly mentioned, these um, uh, you'll see these are even uh, similar in, in look in some ways to the, the global sustainability goals. So there, there's, there's a lot of um, crossover there and a lot of linkage um, across that as well. So in the broader fair trade movement, so in addition to the commodity producers, there's um, uh, nearly a million, not quite, but 965,000 plus livelihoods impacted with the WFTO programs and certification models. So I'm just going to really quickly show you a um, one more quick video, uh, which is a, is the highlights from a, the fashion parade we had in Fashion Revolution this year. Um, so I'll just play that for you. Thank <laughs> you. 
So uh, that brings us to the end of the presentation piece. You can see the contact details there. I'll just stop sharing um, the slides for a minute and um, we're happy to take questions uh, via the, um, the chat or the Q&A um, that's in the side here. Um, so, um, Nimbody, I was just going to add one little last thing on the fashion point because I think it is so profoundly important. I don't know how many of you would have seen I think it was on um, not Catalyst, it was on um, Compass maybe, or one, mm -hmm. one of the international programs. Um, what is happening in the world of fashion? And, and $400 billion a year of fashion in the US alone ends up in landfill. Most of it's been worn once. And I just looking at those beautiful, beautiful fair trade fashions, I just wanted to say how important it is for all of us to be really aware of uh, the, the catastrophe that has unfolded in this whole industry with this churn of stuff through. Um, it's almost like plastic. You know, there's 14 million metric tons of plastic in the oceans. Well, there's most of our fashion is ending up in landfills. And and um, Compass, was it Compass? Did, did you see it, Nimity, that program that was just I, on the It's just slipped my mind as well now, because, um, but, it, but I do, I mean, that-, that foreign correspondent. I think it was Foreign Correspondent. I think it was Foreign Correspondent. Anyway, everybody should watch it, because honestly, you would just have no idea what is happening in the world today, and they have done it, or maybe it was Four Corners, sorry. You'll find it on the ABC somewhere. <laughs> It is fashion run amok. And I just want to say that the, the, the fair trade fashion and the people that really are supporting the hand dyeing, the hand looming, the, the, you know, the amazing work that is really artisanal work uh, in fashion. I would rather spend a thousand dollars on a dress like that and wear it, you know, till the end of time than have half of the stuff that we're all churning through as a regular part of fashion in this day and age. So I just want to say how important that is and that everybody needs to really be very, very aware of it. Absolutely. And uh, that the fashion parade that we just saw was from Fashion Revolution Week. And uh, so we were speaking quite a bit about the, the challenges of the, the global fashion model and uh, what, what the options are, which is always good to, to think about what we can do. So. Um, so I can't see any questions coming through. Um, there is a chat function for those that aren't familiar with Zoom and a Q&A, you can submit questions. We haven't seen any come through. I guess, um, Molly, um, oh, I see there's a question. So I've got one from Graham Williamson asking, how do you define modern slavery? Did you want to cover that or do you want me to? Oh, well, you can start and I can, I can jump yeah, in. Sure. So um, Molly mentioned that modern slavery um, comes in many forms, but uh, it essentially it is where somebody is employed and, and they, they don't have, their choices are taken away is, is the way that I think about it. Um, so the, the main difference in slavery today between what people sort of think about of slavery with sort of, uh, you know, uh, with people in chains and sort of old fashioned movies and things is that slavery is illegal, but it is still happening. And so it is it's a little bit more hidden, although not depending on where you are. But uh, slavery is an example is uh, somebody in a, in a, a poor country um, is invited to go and work in the town thinking they're actually going for a legitimate job. That person finds themselves locked up, unable to leave, working for little or no money, very long hours and very poor working conditions. That's, that's kind of a, a sadly a very classic story of, of slavery today. Uh, there's other examples. I mean, to use a recent example in Queensland, um, uh, they, we've brought fruit pickers across from the Pacific um, uh, since, you know, a very long time. And uh, people will have their passports taken away so that they can't actually leave uh, when they want to on, on shrimp trawlers. It's, it's become infamous that, um, you know, people will be kept out at sea away from their families for, you know, a year and a half or more. And when they sort of please beg, you know, could we please get get off at this at this um, uh, port to to visit our families? They can actually be literally thrown overboard. So it is it is really unbelievable to to see what does go on. And there are many many uh, organizations that are tracking this trafficking and and this kind of horror in the world. 
Um, and it is just the kind of thing that um, I believe, you know, someone asked me recently, um, you know, how do people sleep with themselves, you know, with all this stuff going on in their supply chains? And I said, well, basically, because they've found very, very systematic ways of, of pushing it away so that they can't see it. If they could see it, if they could see it every day, nobody could sleep. Um, and, and so modern slavery really is a very sophisticated way of getting around um, paying a fair price. And it would just be so much easier for all of us to pay a fair price for what we yeah. are asking people to do. And, mm -hmm. and again, in the world, it seems that the poorest are being asked more and more and more of. It's like we're trying to squeeze more and more and more out of the people that have the least. So, we've got to so some, someone's come to our rescue, Molly. It's, uh, Damien has said it was foreign correspondent was the... Uh... Thank you so much. <laughs> I really want people to see it. <laughs> Um, someone else, um, and it's also made a point that um, fair fashion is actually quite affordable, which I think that's a good thing to mention is that actually um, we're talking about paying a fair price, not a crazy expensive price. And so um, certainly one of the things that I find a bit strange about the fashion world is you can go and people spend thousands of dollars, dollars on a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, or on things that are, you know, not quality and actually you can get fairly made um, quality items fairly priced. Um, so um, you, don't, you don't need to think that you need to spend more. Um, we do have a question. You have to be careful though. One thing I would say is that, I mean, we've even had, had cases uh, here in Australia where universities trying to do the right thing, um, you know, end up ending up buying sort of fair trade, which wasn't actually fair trade. It was just sort of a, a copy. And so you do do need to really yeah, be careful. You have to need to do your due diligence and, and check. Absolutely. You really do. Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm wearing, for example, a, um, a, this is made from a recycled sari. And I think one of the things about the fair trade movement that Molly, you touched on is shortening that supply chain so that there's visibility and you know exactly who's making what you're wearing. I think that's really, really crucial as well. The question here from um, Abby, that's probably for you, Molly, she says, how does fair trade ensure that businesses aren't getting accredited, then changing practices later, or letting standards lax? Are they remeasured, or does their accreditation need to be re-verified re at intervals? So, in in the fair trade world, it's very very rigorous. rigorous. There's a legal contract. We, if we catch them at any time um, failing to uphold the standards, uh, and with something like cocoa. Uh, there are unannounced audits uh, and rigorous and more often unannounced audits than in any other commodity, actually, because of the child labor issues associated with, with mm -hmm. cocoa. So um, we have very rigorous ways of ensuring uh, and, and, as I say, a, a structured way of, of exiting anyone who is breaking the rules. Um, so the rules um, are, are very, very clear and there's a legal contract. And that's why fair trade can uh, push push uh, bad players out of the system, no matter where they are in the supply chain. And I would say that is really pivotal to why fair trade is so trusted. Mm -hmm. But again, that is only able to be done in global commodities where there are really, uh, you know, where, where, where that's possible because um, it's, it's from a cost point of view, the way we do this manually these days, it, it is not possible to do that with, with the vast majority of, of things that are traded. And fashion is one of those things that just goes under the radar because there's so much of it, so much of it goes through China. I don't know, actually we've got Clive here on the line and maybe Clive can answer this question in the box, but um, we've actually got um, so much of fashion that goes through China. China doesn't adhere to the fundamentals of the international labor organization. So the ILO conventions are just not even adhered to through China. So it's very difficult to track things through China and even fair trade has trouble and can't always uh, uh, certify uh, certain things because if it's if it's going through certain ways in China we can't um, we can't verify it um, so it's a, it's a challenge it's a big challenge but I would say that within the fair trade world uh, the rigor and the uh, transparency about it is almost it's um, Achilles heel because it is so much more costly to do it that way than with slavery which is the alternative that that so many have gone with in these last decades Yes, so a couple more questions here. So we've got uh, one from Gail. Thanks for the great session. Question from Gail and Antonia from the WA Fair Collective. Um, for Molly, what trends are you noticing in fair trade since COVID? Um, well, I, I actually think that COVID has been interesting for a variety of reasons. One is that I think for most people, um, that, that very real connection to people on the other side of the world and how we affect each other um, has become more real and more salient. And we're seeing in a lot of our uh, Globescan reporting um, that 
Uh, in fact, I think some of the, the recent figures showed that 28% of people were actually changing what they bought uh, based on information that they had for the first time in a long time. So that's a large, that's up, that's twice as many as the year before COVID. So uh, it was around 14% the year before. So it, it's very important that people are changing what they purchase because they get in, information that helps them to, to make a better choice. Um, I do believe that um, the other wonderful thing, and I think this is true for me as much as anybody else, is having everything shut down in Melbourne you realize actually you don't need any of that stuff. <laughs> you, know, you just don't need it. <laughs> another pair of socks, another pair of shoes, yeah, you know. And it's amazing how you go for a year and a half without anything new. <laughs> and all you realize is you discover everything else that was, you know, you haven't been wearing. So I just think that there's a discovery that actually we don't need as much stuff as we, we are encouraged to believe that we need. And, um, and I think that, that connectivity with other parts of the world and that realization that we don't need things and we could be choosier in what we buy um, has been good for everybody. Um, now, of course, it's terrible that there are people dying everywhere. And I can say that producers have been really affected by it. Um, again, in the fair trade world, we were very fortunate. Uh, the board, the global board agreed immediately to allow producers everywhere in the world in all 75 countries to access their premium funds for COVID prevention and COVID education and anything to do with helping that community right away to address the COVID challenges. And that was something available to fair trade producers that just wasn't available to the vast majority of the world. And if you look at something like flowers in Ethiopia, 90% of the flower market completely collapsed in the first couple of weeks of COVID because of course there were no funerals, weddings, you know, um, uh, you know, everything that was with flowers. Now it turns out that actually people love flowers when they're stuck at home. So actually the flower market did pick back up to about 70% of its former um, uh, state. And we do have now fair trade flowers in Australia for the first time ever. So yes. um, that's been part of our COVID contribution to trying to do something new. So it has been challenging, but I think, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we can see the Himalayas for the first time. People aren't traveling. We figured out how to save a lot of greenhouse gases. And for, for those who haven't been um, uh, affected in terms of loved ones, um, there, there are many lessons that we can carry forward for a better and more sustainable world. Yeah, uh, certainly I know on, on the, um, the smaller producer side in, in our world, um, a lot of the businesses in Australia have, you know, done things like ensure that they continue to pay their suppliers, even if they couldn't get stock, for yeah, example, isn't that just to keep them going and that sort of stuff. So I think there's um, that, that um, sense of uh, solidarity and global community has been really um, important. Strengthen. Mm, and strengthened. Yeah. Mm. Yes, yeah. Um, so there's a question here, how does the FTA relate to the Slavery Act? Um, so I, I mean, I, I, I guess um, that fundamentally, um, one of the 10 principles of fair trade is no forced labour. Uh, so it's uh, really about looking at that supply chain and understanding how to, how to investigate the supply chain, firstly, and then understanding how to ensure that it is slavery free. And we do actually partner with Be Slavery Free, who are instrumental in um, helping to um, uh, bring the, the, the Slavery Act um, to light in Australia. Mm. Molly, did you want to add anything to that? Only that the, that the Modern Slavery Acts uh, here and in the UK, they're proposing it now in New Zealand, um, but um, they, they, they're really designed to try to shed light on the problem because until we can see what's really going on, we can't fix it. So most, I mean, the, the idea that it's only affecting or it's only asking companies that are, uh, have a turnover of 100 million or more to report, from Fairtrade's point of view, we didn't think that was um, really uh, appropriate because actually it's, it's more of the smaller and medium sized operators that have no reputation to, to be worried about that are likely to be having some problems. Um, and, and, and there's no visibility there. So we felt that it should be applied to everybody universally, but we do believe that this will be a case of once we can see and get a handle on what's actually going on, then that, that, that the companies that are doing the right thing, the fair trade certified companies, um, the ones that really care about fair trade in the world um, will actually be demanding that others are, are held to the same standard that they're already investing in. So we hope that this will push us to a, a, a higher bar um, but at the moment, uh, there are no penalties. Um, and actually, it's quite important that we figure out how to find the stuff before we, uh, before we instig instigate the penalties. Because if we push the penalties too soon, 
basically they'll just keep figuring out how to hide it and how to you know have that plausible deniability and that's what we've got to overcome and we can't overcome that without real effort on the part of, of global um, uh, customs agents and the whole nine yards it's not an easy problem to overcome actually no yeah Th there is another question here from camilla how do you determine what a fair price is for a commodity um, well, look, that's not nearly as hard as it seems, you know, in the world today, we can actually calculate what is the value of a watershed versus the value of, of um, building a water treatment plant. And um, we can we can actually measure the, the value of things in, in quite a remarkable way in something like um, commodities. It's actually very straightforward. The farmers have uh, constraints, they have costs of production. And we can see exactly and we can measure what those costs of production are. And we know when there's a, a minimum price that's covering that cost of production. And we know that it's nowhere near a living wage. And to be a living wage properly, uh, it actually would have to mean you have schools, you have the possibility of infrastructure like water hospitals and roads. All of those things that we take for granted are not built into the to the way we price commodities in the world. So um, it's not hard to measure them. It's actually very, very easy to measure them. It's just that we don't do that as a as a, um, a standard practice. And I guess one of the things that has always flummoxed me in the world of fair trade is what and how could we actually address this whole issue of commodity trading? Because the globe is basically a giant casino and the way we manage global commodities is just completely inappropriate. And nobody's come up with, and that's what I'm waiting for the next generation to come up with, what is the alternative to a casino that actually pushes prices down and makes um, a mockery of, of uh, human rights? Um, and how do we overcome that? Because that's really the structural impediment that's driving the prices um, in, in crazy ways that makes livelihood so difficult. Yes, it just becomes a number rather than thinking about the people behind the number. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So there is just a comment here from Murray. He said, uh, Murray from Community Projects Worldwide, more of a comment than a question. To reinforce what Molly was saying in 20 years in the fair trade movement, I would say information for the consumer is critical and certainly recently has been sought out more and more. So I think that's that's very valid and, and certainly, uh, as Molly's mentioned, is really, um, I think, where fair trade stands out from other movements is the um, is the credibility in that fair trade mark. Yeah. yeah. OK, well, we, we have um, hit our hour. Um, are there any um, more questions? Uh, I don't, it doesn't look like there, there are. So we might we might finish up there. Anything you'd like to add to finish up, Molly? Oh, I, I would only just say that it's a real pleasure, um, uh, Nimity, to uh, work with you and the association. And I really want to just um, uh, honor the amazing people all over the world that are trying to help build this in fair trade and in, in uh, WFTO. Uh, my own team are just phenomenal. You know, we have been really affected by COVID here in Melbourne, where half of my team are. And um, they have just hung in there. You know, we've been locked up for 200 and something, 60 something days here in Melbourne. <laughs> and they're working harder than ever and doing the most amazing work. So I just want to say that it takes it, it, it takes the whole world to do this. It's not an easy thing that we're trying to do. And we may not in our lifetime see the, the back end of slavery, you know, um, but but I think that it is really encouraging that there are so many people concerned and, and interested and willing to to take a stand on it. So I think it's great and it's lovely to do this with you, Nimity. Thank you, likewise, Molly. I've really um, enjoyed speaking with you. Uh, just reshared there our contact details. We're all on all of the usual places, of course. So thank you everyone for joining and um, we'll see you next time. Thanks guys, take Thanks. care.